Thank you, Barry. On behalf of the Virginia Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us in this important conference on energy and sustainability. I look forward to continuing this candid discussion on how the private and public sectors can work together on this long-term energy needs of Virginia's rep residents and the business community. When we put together the Blueprint Virginia Business Plan for the Commonwealth, we had 7,000 business and community leaders weigh in, including many that are here in the room today. And with their unified voice, the Virginia Chamber has made ensuring our energy security and sustainability one of the pillars in our long-term vision for economic development. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Brooke Smith is an environmental and natural resources partner at Troutman Sanders, where he helps to lead the firm's strategic initiatives on environmental markets, sustainability, energy, water, and compliance assurance. Troutman Sanders is an international law firm with lawyers participating in offices located throughout the U.S. and Asia. In 2014, Brooks formed the National Water Quality Trading Alliance, a consortium of leaders from the business, governmental, nonprofit, regulated, private capital, and entrepreneurial communities focused on enhancing and expanding market-based opportunities for improving water quality. Just last week, Brooks was recognized as one of the National Law Journal's 50 Energy and Environmental Trailblazers for these efforts. Please join me in welcoming Brooks Smith. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm honored to be with you. I really am just a simple environmental lawyer, but a uh, hallmark of my career is to surround myself with smart people. Um, our table there includes Clark Lewis, who heads our firm's Troutman Sanders Strategies practice, which is government affairs and lobbying. And we're so pleased to see so many clients and friends in the audience, including Dominion and ODEC and Aqua Virginia and many, many others. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, last night, I was part of an award ceremony, uh, the project um, that I've worked on for seven years now in Ohio to build a market in advance of regulation uh, that might be so successful as to avert the need for regulation. And the project was awarded the U.S. Water Prize. Uh, and it was one of three prizes awarded last night. Interestingly, the other awardees included the city of San, Di San Diego, which after 20 years of trying has um, turned what goes in your toilet into drinking water, which is kind of scary. Um, but it serves a fundamental need out there, which is the scarcity of water. And Coca-Cola, which you heard about earlier, uh, and their very audacious goal to replenish 100% of the water they use in their business. And as part of that award ceremony, uh, Bob Perciuseppe, the former deputy uh, administrator of EPA, uh, made reference to the water diamond paradox. And all night I was flummoxed to try to find out what that was. And I found it, and I thought I would start with it. Uh, it goes back to Adam Smith. Of course, you always want to start with something from the 1700s. This is an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And he said, nothing is more useful than water, but it will purchase scarce anything. Scarce anything can be had in exchange for it. A diamond, on the contrary, has scarce any value in use, but a very great quantity of other goods may frequently be had in exchange for it. And this paradox of diamonds and waters, to be perfectly honest, uh, has vexed me for 20 years in professional practice. Um, how do you make sense of it, and, and how perhaps might you transcend it? In my experience uh, in the practice of law and trying to pursue sustainability for clients, uh, there's two nuggets of wisdom that in, have informed environmental policy. One comes from a former EPA official, Luana Wiltshire, who was a former uh, Office of Water Administrator in EPA. And her favorite slide, which she begins all remarks with, is EPA does not derive its authority from God, uh, which is to say EPA is not infallible and the extent of EPA authority is not um, uh, ubiquitous. And the other came from Bob Perciuseppe, Deputy Administrator, last night, which is it is impossible to regulate everything. We cannot possibly achieve our goals uh, for our generation and future generations by way of regulation. 
And there's many polarizing examples of that today, some of which you heard about this morning, like the Clean Power Plan or the, or the waters of the U.S. rulemaking. But to me, these nuggets uh, become the hallmarks of sustainability as a framework for getting past the do loop of regulation. Um, regulation is imperfect because EPA is not infallible or incomplete because EPA can't regulate everything or for which enforcement is inherently complicated and risky and costly and unsatisfying. It's not just about uh, doing good, as we heard earlier, but it's about doing right. And perhaps if we do right, uh, we can go beyond what that regulatory landscape requires and also past the, the guideposts of regulation. So I'm trying to reimagine my role in that world and in the course of doing so, in this personal odyssey, there's one person who has been a constant guide star and a mentor and a source of inspiration, and that's Dennis Tracy, who I have the honor of introducing. If Jurgis Rudkiss and Upton Sinclair's The Jungle personified the plight of meat packers at the turn of the century, uh, then Dennis Tracy uh, really personifies um, this, this pursuit out of the jungle for a company like Smithfield Foods to um, not just being an industry leader, but frankly an international leader in, in moving the bar. And I will say, um, having witnessed that progression, that it is informed by a couple of key elements. One, um, Dennis helped to make compliance organic within the company um, so that it fit the corporate model. He also engaged in what I think is now known as radical transparency. And the first time I ever heard the phrase, listening is the greatest sign of respect, came from Dennis Tracy, which is also something we heard earlier. You can't mollify all your critics, but you can't get anywhere unless you listen to them. And sometimes by listening, you can find some common ground and you can also narrow the issues uh, that you can't get past. Hopefully by narrowing them, maybe you can find some other solution. And he also included everyone, every single person in the community, within the company, um, this larger contingent of people who care, and made it everybody's business, uh, not just compliance as a core function of the business, but also sustainability as a measure of performance that transcended business success and also enabled this goal to be realized. And then, of course, he went beyond in a phrase that I also borrow from him, this BHAG phrase, big, hairy, audacious goals. You know, it's not enough to achieve compliance. You then have to go beyond compliance. And it's not just environmental, but it's all of the pillars of sustainability uh, that Smithfield now embraces. So uh, with that, uh, it gives me great honor and privilege to introduce Dennis and actually read his bio, uh, which I owe you. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer, overseeing and directing many areas within the company including government affairs, corporate communications, sustainability initiatives, and the legal department. Dennis also serves as the executive director of the Smithfield Luter Foundation, the philanthropic wing of Smithfield Foods that funds education and growth opportunities in communities across America. Dennis also serves or has served on dozens of state and national boards and commissions. Prior to joining Smithfield Foods in 2002, Dennis was director of the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. He also served as Assistant Attorney General in the Natural Resources Section of the Virginia Attorney General's Office. He is a 2010 Distinguished Environmental Law graduate from the Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon, where he graduated in 1983. He completed his undergraduate degree in fisheries and wildlife at Virginia Tech in 1978 and currently serves on its Board of Directors, Board of Visitors. So please join me in welcoming Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Brooks. I appreciate it. All right. I didn't expect that because um, I'm going to tell them to give a real short introduction. <laughs> um, thank you all for staying through lunch and listening to this panel. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Um, I, um, when I think about the Chamber of Commerce, I used to be on the board. I, I think I'm still sort of on the board. I'm not sure how that works. but. Uh, I can tell you that they think about sustainability and environmental issues as an integral part of what they do. Uh, Virginia is a unique place, and if you have relationships, if you jointly attempt to solve problems, you can get that done. That happens here, and the chamber is a really important uh, piece of that puzzle. 
Uh, I also want to thank Bob Langert for coming in from McDonald's. He, I thought he made a really interesting talk this morning. Uh, it kind of set the stage for this panel. Uh, but Bob, you, you don't have to get out of Virginia. We don't have to go to Chicago too often because we have great sustainability leaders right here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And they're on the stage here. Uh, we know each other. Uh, we interact with each other, share war stories and, and uh, trials and tribulations and successes together. And I thought it would be a really interesting group for you to hear from. Uh, and I thought we'd have a conversation about sustainability and try to keep it informal. Uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to uh, ask some questions of, of each other. Uh, we're going to then uh, turn it to you. So thank you for your questions. And then we're going to end with the always exciting lightning round uh, for our for our panelists. So, with that, I'm going to I'm going to start. Um, I'm Dennis Tracy. At, I work at Smithfield Foods. Our sustainability program consists of six pillars. Bob did five, I think, four or five. Uh, they're very similar. I'm, we're in the food business, so ours are environmental, uh, animal care, worker safety, uh, community activity, food safety. And then the one that we just added is value creation, and you heard Bob talk about that. We have to be able to be part of our company. And with that, I'm going to ask the panel to self-introduce them, uh, themselves and give a sentence or two about their program before we get into the questions. You can turn on your uh, brochure, and you'll see who they are and their titles and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'd like for them each to give a little brief introduction. So Doug, let's we'll start with you. Glad to do it. Been really happy to be here. Doug Palmore. Uh, Luck Companies, uh, and just for those who don't know, Luck Companies is a 92-year-old family-owned, family-operated business. I actually started here in the city of Richmond. We're now headquartered out in, uh, in Goochland County. And, and we have four business units, uh, Luck Stone Centers, which is architectural stone and granite countertops. We also have a business, Hard True Sports. And if any of you have played on a green clay tennis court surface uh, in the United States, it's probably our product, and that's actually a worldwide business for us. So. A little company in Goochland County, Virginia is a worldwide business in that market. We also have Luck Development Partners, which is a commercial and mixed-use real estate uh, development company. And then the company that we're best known for is Luck Corporation, which is a, uh, which, which is a quarry. Uh, we have about 20 sites where we quarry crushed stone and distribute crushed stone uh, throughout the Mid-Atlantic for you know, infrastructure and transportation type projects. So we have a, a somewhat of a broad range of businesses, and, and we have a significant uh, you know, we, have a, it, we, we can't run from the fact that we have a significant impact on the environment and the communities we operate. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes, but we really focus our sustainability efforts around our communities uh, and our associates. And so, Dennis, it's a real pleasure to be on the, on the panel and look forward to talking with you all some more. Thanks, Doug. Jennifer? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Hunter. I am with Altria. Um, Altria is the owner of three um, premier tobacco companies, Philip Morris USA, U.S. Smokeless Tobacco Company, and John Middleton. Um, we also own Newmark, which is an innovative tobacco company that is focused on um, e-vapor products. And we have a wonderful premium wine company that's uh, headquartered in Washington State, uh, St. Michelle Wine Estates. Um, so when you make products that are intended for adults, um, we work very hard to try to understand um, what is in the interest of the business as well as what different um, stakeholders expect of us. Um, we know and have learned over the years that we need to address our core tobacco issues. So things like reducing the harm of the product, making sure kids aren't using our products, um, uh, making sure we communicate about the health effects for marketing responsibly, and for those folks who are interested in quitting, making sure that we provide information to help them do so. Um, so our efforts are really focused there, but we also have learned, like any company, and like all companies, there are a broader set of expectations. So treating your employees well, investing in your communities, managing your supply chain, um, as well as the environment. So those are all aspects of our corporate responsibility activities. They flow directly from the mission of our company, which is great because we're able to have direct line of sight. Um, to what is in the business's um, best interest for long-term um, profitability um, and consumer satisfaction. Great. Thanks. Blair? I'm Blair Winbush. I'm the uh, Chief Real Estate and Chief Sustainability Officer for Norfolk Southern Corporation. We're a rail freight transportation company with operations in 
22 states basically east of the Mississippi. We operate about 20,000 route miles. We have an extensive port and intermodal network that we operate. I've had the pleasure of serving as Chief Sustainability Officer for more than seven years now. And during that time, uh, Norfolk Southern has evolved to a very comprehensive, integrated uh, sustainability effort around uh, energy, the environment, the economy, and society. And uh, we have a lot of interesting and exciting pro projects that we work on every day, and I'll be happy to tell you more about them when we have the opportunity. Great. Jim. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. I grew up in Richmond. I'm now based in Washington. I'm Senior, senior VP of Corporate Public Affairs, and sustainability in, in the United States is, is an area I cover. Think of the internet as connecting the world virtually. UPS, in a sense, connects the world physically. When you order products anywhere in the world, we move, we move packages worldwide. We're the largest logistics company in the world. We move them with our 100,000 trucks, our hundreds of aircraft, by rail and where need be, by ship. For us, sustainability, as Bob indicated, is a matter of competitive advantage. It's much more than compliance. For us, Bob was trying to sell beef, we're trying to sell packaged services. So that's, that's UPS. All right, and Mari. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mari Weingartner. I'm Vice President of Operations at Universal Leaf Tobacco Company. For those of you who don't know a lot about Universal Leaf, uh, Universal is a leaf supplier. We do not manufacture consumer products but we uh, source tobacco and work with farmers around the world to produce quality tobaccos. Due to our agricultural stance uh, and our locations in thir over 30 countries around the world, sustainable tobacco production is critical to Universal and the future of Universal. Uh, we work uh, diligently every day with our growers, with our uh, laborers, with our grower and labor communities uh, we work very hard on environmental issues such as air, water, and um, soil quality. Uh, we push research and development through the world uh, to basically minimize the impact of our agricultural activities. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here and I look forward to talking to you more about our programs. That's great. Thank you. Well, that's our panel. Um, uh, it is the way we're going to do this is I'm going to direct some questions to these folks and invite the panelists to maybe have a brief follow-up comment or two, nothing lengthy, uh, and then we'll turn it over to you here in a little while. Uh, Doug, I'm going to start with you if that's Great. okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with, uh, with Luck Companies and, and what you've done, uh, but I'd like to know, and I think the folks out here would like to know, what is the main driver behind your sustainability program, and specifically, why do you have one? Well, the, the main driver really starts with our mission, and Jennifer, you mentioned mission, but uh, our mission doesn't actually talk about stone or tennis courts. We have three basic elements. It's about leadership, values-based leadership, uh, having a positive impact, and igniting human potential. And you can't ignite human potential, and you can't have a positive impact if you're not a sustainable, socially responsible organization. So it really does start there for us with our mission. And then, as I said earlier, driving it down one level from there it really is about our communities and our, and our, and the, and our neighbors uh, in, the, in the communities in which we operate and then our associates. Um, this is going to come as a big surprise probably to everyone in here, but quarries aren't people's first choice as their next new neighbor. <laughs> and so the standard of care that we have to have just in operating our business is very high. And, and, it, and, and so we know that, I mean, we're an intensive industry. Uh, we're an important industry, we're a fundamental industry, industry, but we know that the standard is high and so that we have to have, have incredibly strong environmental programs, incredibly strong sustainability programs in order to get, to get and maintain a social license to operate. And so that is a significant driver for us beyond just our corporate desire and, and the desire of the Luck family to do the right thing. And then our associates, our people. Um, Charles Luck Jr., when he started the company 92 years ago, said, if you take care of your people, they'll take care of you. And we've advanced that forward now to the idea of igniting human potential. But again, we feel like that 
it is critically important to have a special place to work for our folks. And, you know, as we look forward to the folks that we have currently within our organization, but also attracting and retaining the best and brightest that are out there in this audience and, and, and amongst us, we know that we have to be a place that uh, has very strong sustainability programs. We have a story to tell. Um, there's a why to what we do, not just a what. And so, um, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time and effort focusing on creating a really special place to work for our people. Um, we have, and, and one of the areas where that focus uh, is, is, is most apparent is around safety. Again, as you can imagine, with the intensive industry that we run, safety is a huge issue. Um, and you can't ignite human potential if folks are worried about their, safe, their health and safety in the workplace. So I am proud to say that uh, just recently we were recognized by the Mine Safety and Health Administration uh, as, as being the, uh, the, uh, large, the best large quarry company in the United States with the lowest safety incident record. So that was quite an accomplishment for us. So across the entire United States, we had the best safety record of any large quarrier. So again, our programs are really based around we know we have a significant impact with respect to the environment and our primary business, Luxstone and the quarry business, and we have people that make our business uh, what it is today. So, Dennis, the focus of our sustainability programs and, where, and what really drives us forward is being a good neighbor, being a, a community steward, and taking care of our people. That's great. Anybody else have a thought on, on uh, the uh, reason for your sustainability program? I think it goes to something um, that I, I believe Brooks said. You know, there was a lot of regulation of the rail industry, but at some point we decided there was something beyond compliance and remediation, and there was an opportunity to operate in a better fashion. And that's why we adopted a sustainability uh, initiative uh, that we've carried through this time. Well, I'll tell you, at Smithfield, uh, most of you know who we are. Uh, we sort of had to. We were in a bad place and uh, had to move in a new direction. And these kind of programs helped us do that, and our employees rally around them, and they're so proud of them. All right, Jennifer, you're up. I'm up. Um, the, uh, you heard Bob this morning talking about company goals and how they work or they don't work. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's, been, what's been your experience? Has setting goals affected your company's environmental progress? Has it worked? It has. <laughs> and um, th what's neat about um, what we've been able to do in our environmental efforts is really um, an indication of what we're going to try to do going forward. So you have success in an area, and then you apply those learnings in another area. Um, Philip Morris USA, which is our largest operating company, um, had set longer term um, goals. Um, and they were very focused on what that operating company really needed to be able to do. And as our corporation was restructuring over a number of years, um, we determined that there was value in really establishing enterprise-wide environmental goals. So it wasn't just Philip Morris USA, but we wanted to make sure that all of the companies that we owned we were able to identify a key set of um, areas where we wanted to make progress. Um, we are an agricultural business. Um, we rely on tobacco and grapes. Um, so we understand the uh, impact of our environmental footprint and really want to make sure that we have those resources um, available to us. But we also know it's important to a variety of stakeholders that you do, in fact, address your environmental footprint. So what we were able to do is um, really take a step back, identify where are the areas that um, our business has an impact, where people expect us to do something, and um, first focus on those areas. So for us, it's energy, it's air, it's water reduction, it's um, waste and recycling, and then it's packaging. Once you identified the areas, we then were able to establish goal areas. And so we established longer term goals. So it was 2012 through 2016. So we just finished our third year of the goals. What has been very helpful about establishing goals, it focuses activity, right? So our chief operating officer is the sponsor of our goals. Um, he's able to interact with each of the business units. You're able to unleash the talent and innovation inside of the organization. 
because they understand what they're trying to achieve over a longer um, period of time. Um, so you're able to also um, prioritize resources, look at different innovative ways um, to make progress. The other thing it allows you to do is be more transparent in the progress that you're making. And so that's one of the big learnings that we've had, which you set your goals, you're measuring progress against those goals, you identify the gaps if you're falling short, um, and you're able to course correct. Um, if you're making progress, you want to know what are we doing so we can continue that um, going forward. But for those stakeholders who are interested in knowing what kind of progress are you making, you have a very clear framework to report against. And so we have found that to be extremely um, helpful. I am happy to report that in um, four of the five focus areas, um, as of the data that we have today, um, we expect that we actually will exceed our um, long-term goals. And we actually are going to um, begin the process of identifying the next set of goals. And as I said, because we've really learned a lot there, we're going to try to capture those learnings and apply those to other areas of our responsibility portfolio to see if we can be as clear and focused in reporting progress. That's great. Thanks. The rest of you have goals? You have goals in your programs? Absolutely. Yeah, who doesn't, right? Is right. that what you're yeah. telling well, me? You, yeah, you better, right? Because as Jennifer said, it helps to focus attention. And in our case, uh, we're a big consumer of diesel fuel. And so we have a greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction goal that we set uh, about five years ago. We've, we're uh, reviewing the data, and I think we're very close to meeting a 10% reduction goal um, uh, that we set for that. And we'll start this process of resetting. And uh, for us, particularly with a business-to-business -business organization, you know, when you're not directly facing consumers, uh, like the position our company holds, the goals are really important. We're obviously in you know, continual dialogue with our customers regarding their goals and how we fit into their supply chain goals. But you know, without goals in a you know, business-to-business -business unit where you're not in necessarily the, the public eye every day, uh, the goals are r really important to, to push through what you're trying to do to increase transparency in the organization and you know, lead to the results that you can share with your customers and hopefully benefit, benefit them. Hey, Mari, I'm going to stay with you. Uh, you mentioned supply chain. Uh, we all have them. We're all part of them. Some of us are at the top of them and some are at the bottom. Um, what strategies are you using in your supply chain with your partners and stakeholders to complement your sustainability efforts? It's a real tough nut to crack. <laughs> it is. It uh, takes continual work. Um, for us, you know, as with many organizations, the fact of the matter is our supply chain uh, has a more direct, uh, has a more, more impact on sustainability issues than our business itself that's directly controlled by our company interests. So, you know, from, from a historical perspective, from early days, the first step we took was to uh, you know, in addition to our customers, which are very obviously, what, who are our stakeholders? What do we need to do? Uh, what strategies do we need to put in place? And of course, for us, our biggest group of stakeholders are the farmers, uh, whether it be in the United States. I'll, I'll use the U.S. as an example, of course, uh, given the location. Uh, Brazil, Mozambique, just to give three three continents. Uh, you know, for us. The important thing about setting the stage with the stakeholders is realizing that you can't have a single strategy. It has to be a regional and local strategy with a, those stakeholders. A, a farmer in the U.S. is much different than a farmer in Brazil as in Mozambique. In Mozambique, we work with approximately 110,000 smallholder growers, and their challenges are vastly different uh, coming from a uh, basically a war-torn country uh, uh, when we entered to, to grow tobacco, we, we basically had to enact a, an agronomy stance with a, a big agronomy staff to implant knowledge of how to grow tobacco at, at the basic level, but further to that, how to do it in a sustainable fashion. Uh, in Brazil, it, it's maybe uh, in between a Mozambique and the U.S., 
but still we work with 35,000 growers and they have a, a, you know, they need to understand the sustainability impacts of the supply chain, the importance of actions they can take locally that have a vast impact on uh, the downstream uh, companies, including the ultimate uh, manufacturer and consumer. Uh, translating that isn't always easy, but the way we've done it in a number of areas is by setting up things like model farms. We basically set up um, a way to communicate in, in the communities uh, where we have farm leaders, let's say, call, call them our best farmers, but uh, our most reliable farmers, but we put them in a place, they're in the local community, there are many growers living around them, and we basically identify the best practices we want to put on those model farms, put them in place, show people basically the benefits, uh, whether it be you know energy reduction, uh, whether it be uh, no-till uh, soil conservation. You have to demonstrate these things to people to help, help them to understand that it can be a benefit for, for them. Uh, in the U.S., it's a little bit different situation with a you know, long, long history of, of tobacco production, uh, well, uh, basically of agriculture in general. Um, you know, in the U.S., we have to take a different approach, and that is you know, linking with the land-grant universities, either through uh, philanthropic uh, initiatives or direct uh, funding of research related to, to uh, crop production. Uh, and, and really, a lot of that is applicable not only to the U.S. grower, but growers around the world. The, the U.S., of course, has had a strong history in leading advancements in agriculture. Here in the U.S., we've had the, the obvious costing pressures, so we, we've basically had to lead the world in, in uh, economizing. And, and quite honestly, that's directly in line with, with uh, sustainability goals, which is reducing your cost by reducing the use of natural resources, uh, by um, making quality tobacco available and showing people how to do it in, in a very sustainable manner, uh, minimizing the impact. Uh, just to give another example, um, in, in Brazil, you know, Brazil has had a vast amount of development and for us, we are a significant employer in our area of operation, and there, you know, the stakeholders are broader. It's community-based. It's the communities of farmers, but it's also uh, the communities of our workers. We, we've put in place uh, community uh, service centers, let's say, where we're providing areas for um, the local community to come to get uh, health care advice or to uh, to receive, uh, you know, even, even uh, simple financial advice. Um, we've done that. Uh, we've implemented citizenship programs where we allow the children of our employees and local communities to come in to learn more about the world, uh, called a, a, a citizenship, citizenship training program where they learn more about their home country, but also more about the world context, which has been very helpful. In a, place like Mozambique, we have similar community outreach where we're teaching about the value of uh, natural resources, including forestry uh, resources, um, simple things of tree plantings. We do more, more commercial scale tree plantings ourselves and in cooperation with our growers, but even to bring uh, local communities together to talk about these things. Uh, to, to, pr to prove the value of these resources, to explain the, the, the struggle we have in other parts of the world with natural resources, even though some of our areas are very rich in natural resources, to, to teach a, a, a person about the struggles around the world helps a lot to, to, to push the issue. So that's just a few examples of uh, some of the, 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 whether it be community outreach within our, um, our own facilities, uh, we, we have not only partnerships directly with growers, but we even broaden that to have uh, partnerships between our customers, our growers, and ourselves called a, you know, triangular uh, sustainability initiatives. Some examples of that are, for example, in water protection in Brazil, where it's very critical. 
We've partnered with a number of our customers to, to implement programs uh, at, the, at the base level to protect uh, uh, stream banks to uh, even not only from, let's say, tobacco production, but from all agricultural activity. Uh, we've also partnered with uh, customers to uh, increase the food security of growers in our areas around the world. Uh, where we're not only training on tobacco, but we're training on, you know, growing all food crops uh, to help farmers diversify. We've also helped to find markets for some of these agricultural products. And uh, uh, with that, I think I'll wrap it up. Just That's a great. few examples of. Well, I tell you, it's real substantive stuff, and and it's very impressive. And uh, Blair, I'm going to ask you something that I've wanted to ask people for a long time. Um, <laughs> A lot, a lot of folks think sustainability is a fluffy thing that's in the office down the hall. Um, a lot of people, you know, Bob Langert makes the argument that no, it's a business thing. It's, it, makes, it makes a difference. When you are prioritizing what you do at Norfolk Southern, uh, do you, do you, how do you do that? Do you, put the, do you prioritize the ones that are best for the community and best for the environment first? Or do you prioritize the ones that get, them the, get you the most publicity? Well, that's a, a nice question, and uh, 35, 40 minutes from now, I'll be done with my answer. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to cut you off. I know you will. Uh, no, I mean, obviously, uh, if you're in business, uh, your reputation is important to you, and, and how the community reacts to you makes a difference. Uh, we're a B2B business primarily, although we have a lot of uh, uh, public exposure because those trains are there and, and you see them. So when we set out to go about doing uh, sustainability, we thought hard about that. And we took a look and said, you know what? We're going to go out and figure out how we can make a difference in certain spaces uh, first. And then we'll worry about generating the publicity by telling our story about it later. Uh, I'll give you an example of one that um, a lot of people don't know about. Uh, we partnered with a Middleburg, Virginia company called Green Trees uh, to do a, uh, a conservation capitalism investment in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, that area is prone to flooding and because a lot of trees were cut out of the floodplain. So through an investment that we made about five years ago, uh, Green Trees has partnered with the local landowners to plant over six million trees over on 10,000 acres. Uh, we'll get carbon credits from the uh, result, and hopefully someday there'll be enough of a carbon market that we'll recoup our investment, maybe even make a little money on it. But meanwhile, we've created an ecosystem on 10,000 acres in the Mississippi Delta. And we had the pleasure of visiting some of those, uh, those tree crops, uh, native hardwoods, uh, about uh, a year ago, and we had some some interesting spin-on benefits that we hadn't even thought about. Uh, one of the, the folks who came to see us while we were there represented the Black Bear Society, or that's not their formal name, but, but they were impressed with the corridor linkages along the Mississippi River that provided bear habitat. We were thinking about trees and the effect on water and, and forestry and all that, and here we are helping other animal habitat including migratory songbirds and the rest. And that's an example where we didn't go about just to enhance our reputation because most consumers don't even know that we've done that. So I'll send you to our uh, Norfolk Southern website to the sustainability section to learn more about it. It's one of the most exciting programs that, that I've been part of as, uh, in my 35 year history with the railroad. That's great. Hey, Jim. He is, I'm going to ask you this, another one. It's related to what Blair just said. Okay. Sustainable brands. We talk about that a lot. Can you be a sustainable brand? A lot of people on TV and they're talking about how sustainable they are and how uh, friendly they are to the environment or to animals or to whatever the issue may be. Is that possible? Is it really possible to have a sustainable brand? Uh, is it, is it, or is that just, again, this is a related question, or is that ad man spin? It certainly can be just ad man spin. It, it all depends on what the company is interested in getting out of sustainability. Um, part of why we went into it, we, we discovered along the way, is there's a lot of passion 
for, save, for preserving the earth. I mean, I've been to business schools where, not just the university, the business school has its own sustainability program. So passion for the, the planet side of it comes almost automatically with your people. For us, it came down to, we knew sustainability was going to be important. We didn't think we were all that good at publicity, at PR, and that our competitors could do a better job and we have a lot of competitors, so I'm not going to be specific, but we thought their threshold for embarrassment was higher than ours. So we figured that if we were going to be recognized as a sustainable brand, and again, we see ourselves as having a competitive advantage in that, we needed not us, but somebody else to say, that's a sustainable brand. So we systematically went after the indicia, the metrics of what is sustainable. And our engineers have made a point through for several years of trying to find the most convincing, persuasive NGOs that rate companies on sustainability and to, um, to get them to recognize that we indeed are sustainable. You don't have to do that. Um, but we think for our long-term business interest, it's good for us to indeed be not just be a sustainable brand, you've got to be able to prove your sustainable brand through objective criteria. Okay, that's great. Blair, I'm coming right back to you. Oh, okay. That, those are compelling arguments why it makes business sense to do these sustainability programs, either for competitive reasons or for uh, uh, reasons uh, that relate to the bottom line. Is your sustainability program sustainable? What happens, what happens when, uh, when you rotate out or your employees rotate out? Is it, is it going to be there? Well, if you had asked me that uh, in November of 2007 when the uh, board of directors asked me to engineer and run a sustainability program, you probably would have gotten a different answer than I'll give you today. Um, and, and the short answer is yes, I think it is sustainable. Uh, I'll get around to uh, what happens uh, when I uh, leave in a, in a minute, but uh, we started out, uh, as I mentioned, looking comprehensively and in an integrated fashion at what we were doing and how we were going about doing business. And as we set out, we, we found, you know, small wins here and there throughout the company, whether it was, uh, you know, something as simple as changing out light bulbs. Uh, which we did on a grand scale. We rolled up all of the, uh, the electricity spend and, and set out to prove that we could save uh, initially about 42% of that consumption and spend. Uh, now we're in the second generation of that and, and we're getting 60% uh, returns on, on, on those, uh, those types of projects. And then we, we found some more ways to demonstrate that to the people inside the company. Uh, we figured out that air conditioners and heating systems fail on either the coolest or the hottest days of the year, and, uh, and then you go and replace them with, it, with no regard whatsoever for efficiency. Well, again, we did a roll-up of the spending uh, and went out and, uh, and started looking at the older, least efficient units and systematically have set about to replace those. And, and that proved to our operations and other folks that, you know, this isn't just a flash in the pan. It's uh, not the uh, program du jour. Uh, but the, the real uh, convincing point for me came about a year ago when uh, one of our advisory council members in, uh, that we, we run a sustainability advisory council composed of people within the company, and one of them, the head of the mechanical group, which is the group that maintains the locomotives and car stock, uh, came to us and said, you know, I'm concerned about this aging coal boiler in this 1880s facility we have in uh, Altoona, Pennsylvania that builds locomotives. And uh, he had to comply with the ever uh, stringent requirements and said, wait a minute, maybe there's a better way. So the sustainability, the energy function group partnered together with that officer to, to finally take a comprehensive look at the entire facility, which encompasses something like 18 buildings. And uh, the, the, the key to 
to my deciding that sustainability is in fact sustainable is that uh, after going through the normal capital budgeting process that every company goes through every year, we convinced senior management and the board to embark upon what was just announced two weeks ago, and that is a three-year, $53 million project to comprehensively alter the energy makeup of that facility, which is key to our long-term business success. And so, you know, it became a, a replacing the, the uh, boilers with the combined heat and power natural gas uh, facility that will give us all the electricity we need. But when we got into that, we re figured out we had to redo all the electricity, all the wiring uh, that makes up the complex. And that wasn't enough. We were putting the heat in, but we were heating the outdoors because the roofing needed efforts and then the windows and doors. And so at the end of the day, we're basically taking these 1880s structures, uh, which have modern equipment inside them, and rebuilding them to 21st century standards. And we're going to save, uh, I don't know, $4 million a year in electricity alone. Uh, ultimately, there is a return on investment there. And as long as that's the approach that you take to sustainability, it will survive the individuals. And uh, as Dennis knows, uh, this is probably my last public appearance as Chief Sustainability Officer. I do have one of my colleagues, AC Waters, manager of sustainability in the...
Penetration, market penetration is always one of the biggest challenges. My question to you is, what are you doing with your employees to encourage them to make efforts in their own personal lives uh, to reduce energy consumption, improve sustainability efforts, so that they then have more money in their pocket to spend in the economy, um, have homes and, and rental places that last longer, and make them better, more productive workers. What, if anything, are any of you doing with your employee base? Who wants that? I'll be happy to do Blair? That. Yeah, for about the, uh, the last several years, we've run a, uh, a communications program or piece of, of our sustainability effort, and it's been almost entirely focused on harnessing the energies of our 30,000 employees in those 22 states I mentioned earlier. Uh, we run a uh, something we call a connections challenge, believing that the entire world is connected, uh, that ask our employees on a monthly basis to engage in some kind of sustainable initiative, whether it's something at work, turning off monitors and computers and, and the lights that don't dim automatically, or whether it's at home, making sure in, in the November challenge that they are geared up for winter and the efficiency issues around that. So uh, we just reviewed with our uh, ad consultant how to uh, drive that engagement in our employees even deeper. Uh, and we've likewise uh, focused some of our philanthropy, which we run through a foundation, on the initiatives that our people bring to us uh, in their communities because, again, uh, we recognize that part of what we do has to impact positively to the best extent possible the communities in which we live and operate. Question right here. My name is AC, and I have the distinct pleasure of working for Blair. And no, he did not pay me to say that. <laughs> um, my question to all of you is on goals and transparency. How do you balance uh, telling, being transparent about the process to get to your goals while minimizing the risk of exposure? Who wants that? I'm not going to tell you. Can, you can't <laughs> have that. <laughs> Jennifer, you have a thought on that? And exposure from the perspective of getting inside the sausage making for, from a business perspective? That's what you're getting at? Yeah. Okay. Um, for us, at least, what um, we've tried to do is, and again, when I talk about the example in the environment, um, because you're posting the goals, um, we're not, we don't communicate the sausage making. Right, And so for us, we think the most important thing is to be intentional about where are you trying to make progress, what does progress look like over time, and then making sure people understand where you are, where your successes are, and, and where your shortcomings are. And oftentimes when we do our reporting, so we just launched our 2014-15 um, CR report, so I invite you all to go to our website, altria.com, um, to have the opportunity <laughs> To look at it but that's where we focus on this is what we're trying to accomplish this is the progress and these are some of the initiatives that we're going to continue to pursue going forward so for us it's less about the sausage making and more about here's what we're trying to do progress successes failures and the path forward I'd like to say sausage making is a very good thing <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Jim I, I would say for us, setting goals is a gut-wrenching <laughs> process. And it is kept in-house. Management does not want to set goals we aren't going to meet. And if you're reaching out to the year 2020, you think of what could happen before the year 2020. So um, a lot of people are involved in it. There's a lot of soul searching. You've got people who think they are new, new ideas, new technologies that can get us there. But it is ugly, ugly, ugly. But once we set it, we go for it. And so far, we seem to be on course. That's great. I have time for one more question. We have a back in the back over here. This gentleman right here. Yes.
and to satisfy the aspirational goals of those nine billion people that businesses, uh, and by the way, the World Business Council is, is on sustainable development is 200 of the largest companies on the planet. They said, we're gonna have to become four to 10 times more resource efficient as we are now. I'd like the panel to, dis to comment on that. That sets the bar I, I, pretty may high. I, I'd like to comment on that. I'm a, I work for a food company. And the big challenge of feeding that many people moving forward in 2050 is something that we're focused on. And it's something the entire food industry is focused on. And it is, uh, it can't be, it, this is my opinion, it cannot be done unless we use all the tools in the toolbox. Uh, we've got to become much more efficient. There's great controversy about GMOs. Uh, we've got to use GMOs. We've got to figure it out. We have to make sure that we're able to provide food for people in a way they can get it. Uh, there's great concern about uh, concentrated agriculture. Uh, some of the uh, environmental groups now on a national and international level are beginning to look at concentrated agriculture as a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, as we are able to grow more and raise more on the same footprint. So um, I think we all need to work together, and I think the energy in the business community needs to be encouraged to move in that direction. Uh, the business community are the folks that solve problems. Uh, they're the ones who take the bull by the horns and try to figure it out and try to make it happen. Otherwise, uh, you're staring at a regulation or uh, uh, an expectation from somebody that you may or may not be able to meet. Dennis, I, I think efficiency is one of the core unifying ideas of sustainability. So efficiency is good for the environment, it's good for natural resources, it, and, it, and it's good for uh, the financial health of businesses. So to me, and Jim talking about so how you create competition and or what would you do next as an NGO, to me, focusing on this idea of efficiency is, is, a, is one of those fundamental unifying ideas of sustainability that we all ought to be focused on because it's good for uh, it, 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 as I said, it's good for business, it's good for the environment, it's good for our people. All right, wait a minute. We're going to go to the lightning round. We have two minutes left. <laughs> lightning round. I've been waiting for this for months. And uh, <laughs> by golly, we're going to do it. So uh, I'm going to ask you these questions, panel members, and I would like you to answer it in one sentence or less. If you can do it in a word, I'll love you forever. All right? What, Doug, I'm starting with you. What has been your biggest mistake in developing your sustainability program? Not, not communicating about it sooner. Jennifer. Not having a clear, simple, powerful way of reporting. Claire. Going after the ideas of those 30,000 people sooner. Thinking that we would be embraced by the environmental community <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and instead saw a demonstration in front of our New York office building in Manhattan with big posters saying UPS supports climate deniers because they found some of our campaign contributions of our PAC went to Republicans who did not agree with climate change. Mari. Not making our first sustainability group more cross-functional, cross-organization. All right, Mari, I'm staying with you. Uh, what has been your most surprising obstacle in creating your sustainability program? I think the number, the number of ideas we, we've gotten from employees and stakeholders is almost overwhelming. I mean, once you start down that path, we've gotten a lot. Sorry, that's Jim. not one sentence. It's not static. It has to be a dynamic process, or it dies. Blair. Understanding that we needed to uh, ramp up the resources. Jennifer. I think for us, it's um, our industry often leaves people feeling as though we don't have anything to contribute to the solution and that we're only part of the problem. And I think if we are all intellectually honest, every company has its issues. It's how you go about uh, participating to solve that makes the difference. And um, I continue to work to help folks understand you may not like our products, but we can do it responsibly and, and we should be part of the solution, Doug. not just the problem. Effectively making the link between our routine business efficiency and environmental activities and sustainability with our, with our associates. Last one in real short terms, what's the worst sustainability claim you ever heard? A layoff is a sustainability initiative. <laughs> <laughs> you have pass. one, Jennifer? Pass. <laughs> I'm going to pass. <laughs> All right, we... <laughs> that if we would only make our little brown trucks more fuel efficient, we would improve our sustainability, which we would mean we would send two trucks to the same address instead of one, if they thought about it. 
Morning. Oh, pass. pass. Another pass. <laughs> Doug, you blew him out of the water. Uh, thank you all very much for listening and staying with us. Thank you, panel. I thought that was fascinating.